Hello and welcome back to International School History Teacher and this series of lessons about the rise to power and rule of authoritarian states. How does the state control the individual? As we've seen, the state uses a mixture of coercion, persuasion and consent to control its citizens. In our last lesson, we explored the use of coercion. Today, we're going to focus on persuasion, the state's informal social control of the individual. The goal of informal social control is to be able to direct people's behaviour without the people being consciously aware that the behaviour is being directed. This includes a wide range of state controls over the media, education and culture in general. Some of these themes we'll return to in our next lesson on authoritarian policies, but here we concentrate on what the historian David Welch has called the essential twins of media control, censorship and propaganda. Censorship means that the state suppresses information or opinion which is offensive or contrary to the views of those in authority. It might be considered a negative form of propaganda. All governments seek to influence what information is presented to the public and how and when this information is presented. This explains why a free and independent press committed to the uncovering and relaying of the truth is such an important feature of democratic government. And it's also why a free press is quickly denounced by authoritarian regimes as the enemy of the people. Fake, fake, disgusting news. Dishonest, terrible people. I'm telling you that. Terrible people. Called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. Now, direct censorship means that the state can decide to withhold information or prevent the expression of a particular viewpoint because its publication and dissemination might otherwise damage the so-called national interest. In more totalitarian regimes, direct censorship is intrusive enough to involve the appointment of official government censors who work alongside journalists and film producers, uh, approving all that can be published. In the Soviet Union, censorship was controlled by the General Directorate for the Protection of State Secrets in the Press, also known as GLAVLID. In Nazi Germany, state representatives in the propaganda ministry expected editors and journalists to register with the Reich Press Chamber and to follow their instructions. This form of censorship was used to prevent, for example, the publication of books or the distribution of films which may have been considered harmful to public morality or ideologically questionable. Along with direct state censorship, there's also indirect censorship, which might be considered more powerful in some ways because the state has no need to be involved in the process at all. With self-censorship, the media, the journalists, the writers, the filmmakers and so on understand the unwritten rule of what is and is not acceptable to be published at any time, and they avoid publishing anything that might upset authority. Self-censorship produces a tendency towards conservative content, second-guessing what the authorities might think, and the avoidance of risk. As the great uh, Czech film director Milos Forman explained, You know, the censorship itself, it's, that's not the worst evil. The worst evil is, and that's the product of censorship, is the self-censorship, because that twists spines that destroys my character, because I have to think something else and say something else. I have to always control some self, uh, myself. Uh, I am uh, stopping to being honest. I am uh, becoming hypocrite. And that's what I wanted. They wanted everybody to feel guilty. Self-censorship is particularly important in capitalist authoritarian regimes which prefer to avoid direct censorship and try to maintain the illusion that a free press continues to exist. Powerful elite social groups may control information through direct ownership of the media or indirectly through advertising revenue. The mass media is a big business which instinctively supports the goals of conservative regimes that seek to weaken workers' rights or undermine the credibility of left-wing alternatives. In Weimar and then Nazi Germany, the industrialist IG Farben's control of Frankfurter Zeitung shifted the independent editorial position to the totalitarian right. Fortunately, the media today is much less likely to enable such populist authoritarianism. President Trump, he's moving very fast to fix the country and keep his promises to you, the American people. He is like the New Testament character of Nathaniel. And he's creating jobs, he's getting promises. It's like he's addicted to results. He's securing our borders, trying to stop crimes against America. He's not afraid of anybody. He'll go into the lion's den. They're very honorable people. Propaganda 
is a conscious attempt to influence the opinions of an audience in a way that is designed to serve the interest of those who create and spread that propaganda. The propagandists usually work for those in positions of political or economic power and therefore seek to influence the opinions and actions of the audience and to align them with those in positions of power. Propaganda is neither concerned with information nor with education. As David Welch puts it, information and education are concerned to broaden the audience's perspectives and to open their minds, and propaganda strives to narrow them, preferably close them. The core distinction lies in the purpose. The methods used to carry the propaganda message are generally limited by the technology available. As Marshall McLuhan wrote in the 1960s, the medium is the message. Propaganda posters were very important in the semi-literate societies at the start of the 20th century, but in the 1920s, cinema became the new visual medium. Television took over the role of radio by the 1960s, and the inability of authoritarian regimes to control the internet and social media led to the collapse of North African dictatorships in the Arab Spring of 2011. I just posted an event calling for a revolution uh, in 10 days. Like, we should all get to the street and we should all bring down Mubarak. Organized by a group of online activists. We're calling it the Facebook revolution. The extent and nature of an authoritarian state's propaganda system is a useful indicator of the very nature of authoritarian control itself. The more ambitious the regime is in its desire to control the individual, the more ambitious the propaganda becomes. At the one extreme, we have governments investing in propaganda as a distraction, keeping the public busy and away from the political decision-making process, as Noam Chomsky explained. The purpose of those media is just to dull people's brains. This is an oversimplification, but for the 80 percent or whatever they are, the main thing for them is to divert them, get them away from things that matter. Uh, and for that, it's important to uh, reduce their capacity to think. On the other end of the propaganda spectrum, we have the sort of ambitious propaganda which seeks to mould and change human nature itself. Now, this complex idea of a propaganda spectrum can be best illustrated with the use of a diagram. Propaganda that is concerned to depoliticise the public by distracting them with harmless entertainment was described by the historian of Franco Spain, Raymond Carr, as the culture of evasion. Its goal is social depoliticization, and this happens in all authoritarian regimes, not just those at the totalitarian extreme. Most of the films approved by Goebbels in Nazi Germany had little or no political message. In Franco Spain, one of the key uh, examples of propaganda as evasion was football. Franco's team, Real Madrid, were European Cup finalists on eight occasions in the period from 1956 to 66, and this helped Spain break out of a international isolation. As football-loving Franco asserted, with Match of the Day and TV, most of my subjects have nothing to complain of. The centre ground on the propaganda spectrum is concerned with social solidarity. It was during the late 19th century, at a time of industrialisation and democratisation, that the state use of propaganda was first developed. As an increasingly democratic state was forced to accommodate the views of wider sections of the populace, elite groups tried to influence public opinion in their own interest. Propaganda at this time was overwhelmingly concerned with nation building, generating social solidarity around what Benedict Anderson described as imagined communities, and the national symbols and customs of what Eric Hobsbawm has called the invented traditions that encourage the popular classes to feel an attachment to the modern nation state. The First World War took the relatively subtle peacetime culture of nation building and gradually replaced it with a systematic mechanism of censorship and propaganda. In fighting a total war, Governments took unprecedented control over all areas of national life, and the control of information was central to this. Modern authoritarianism simply extended it and applied it in times of peace. In the Soviet Union and in other communist countries, the celebration of May the 1st, International Workers' Day, became a central mechanism for building social solidarity. It was a celebration of the historic triumph of the working class against capitalism and an opportunity to show off the successes of a communist planned economy. And finally, we come to the most ambitious propaganda project, totalitarian social transformation. Now, propaganda for building social solidarity or for entertaining evasion is not enough for totalitarians. Totalitarian regimes need to mobilise whole swathes of the population in support of the transformative programme, and in the process they seek even to transform what it means to be human. For Stalin, the project of building communist society required the creation of a communist man, a distinctive and higher order of human nature than had been possible under feudalism and capitalism. 
In Mao's China, the Cultural Revolution set out to create a new human being by destroying all that was old, even replacing the traditional opera with new revolutionary versions that reinforced the goals of the workers' regime. So from evasion that seeks to distract and depoliticize, through the hyper-patriotism of social solidarity, through to the ambitious social transformation brought about through the mobilization of the public, propaganda was central to the ability of the state to control its people. A key concept shared with many modern authoritarian states is the tendency to encourage the growth of personality cults around charismatic leaders. Now, personality cults were not new to the 20th century, but the development of the mass media of popular newspapers, radio and newsreel, at the same time as the arrival of modern authoritarian states, created new opportunities for a cult of authoritarian leaders to be widely disseminated for propaganda purposes. As such, a personality cult is another example of informal social control. The sociologist Max Weber wrote about the importance of charismatic leadership in 1922, the same year as Mussolini's March on Rome brought the first example of charismatic authoritarianism to power. With a personality cult, the charismatic leader embodies the state. The regime and the leader are fused into one. It has several functions. Firstly, it makes the political process intelligible for the masses. Secondly, the leader, like the traditional kings and emperors, can be placed above the political fray as a representative of the common man against the elites. If only Stalin knew is a phrase now associated with the phenomenon whereby victims in authoritarian states blame everyone but the leader. And finally, the leader becomes a familial source of loyalty and genuine affection, a big brother or a father figure who over time becomes a source of consistency and comfort. As Orwell said, he loved big brother. So, in conclusion, informal social control is central to the ability of the authoritarian state to manage the individual citizen. Censorship and propaganda are the essential twins of media control, but there is more to informal social control that needs to be discussed. Control over education and the arts are also important sources of informal social control, but they are also part of a whole range of authoritarian policies that aim to make social control itself redundant. For the state's control of the individual is at its most effective when the individual chooses to be controlled and consents to lose their freedom. Now that'll be the subject of our next lesson. So more on that next time. Disappear